to uh, open the formal introductions to Matt Klein, our uh, fourth year research resident. Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mancheja uh, at Grand Rounds uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Mancheja started uh, her career as an undergraduate at the University of Illinois, um, where she received a, a BS in microbiology and an MS uh, in biology. Uh, she then continued uh, her career um, at uh, Chicago Medical School, where she received a PhD in neuroscience working with uh, Dr. Marina Wolf uh, in the area of drug abuse. Uh, Dr. Manteja then uh, continued at Yale University, a fellowship with uh, Dr. Uh, Eric Nessler uh, in the area of molecular psychiatry. Uh, while there, she received a postdoctoral NSRA fellowship, uh, as well as a NARSAD award. Uh, she then joined uh, the faculty at the uh, Department of Psychiatry at UT Southwestern, um, where she ultimately held the Ginny and John Eulich Professorship in Autism Spectrum Disorders. Uh, Dr. Montagia is currently the Barlow Family Director at the Vanderbilt Brain Institute, uh, where her lab focuses on the molecular and cellular, <coughs> cellular basis of neuroplasticity uh, as it pertains to neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, Dr. Montagia has received numerous awards, which I'll just uh, mention a few. Uh, the Daniel X. Friedman Award from NARSAD for Outstanding Research, uh, the Rising Star Award from the International Mental Health Research Organization, uh, and the Daniel H. Efron Award uh, for Outstanding Research from ACNP. Uh, Dr. Montagia has also uh, recently been elected uh, as a counselor for Society of Neuroscience and also serves uh, on the NIH, uh, Board of NIH uh, Brain Institute, uh, sorry, Brain Initiative. Uh, she's also a senior editor uh, at the Journal of Neuropsychopharmacology, uh, as well as an editor of numerous other uh, journals, including eLife, uh, J Neuroscience, uh, JBC, Biological Psychiatry, and Hippocampus. Um, I'm very much looking forward uh, to hearing her talk today uh, on the mechanism of rapid antidepressant responses. Um, so please welcome uh, Dr. Montasia. Thank you. So thank you for all coming up this morning. I'm delighted to be here, and I've had a wonderful, wonderful visit. So I'm going to talk to you about our work on antidepressants. And I'm going to try to do this really instead of talking about multiple different stories, I'm going to really try to feed this into one story and kind of go through our logic and our interface on the clinical side of what we're doing and what we hope to do with this project. So as this audience is aware, major depressive disorder is characterized by a range of symptoms. And I just, can I OK. It's OK. Um, I was just looking for the pointer. That's OK. OK. Um, so it's characterized by a range of symptoms. And the point of showing this slide is really to highlight the heterogeneity of the symptoms. And while that's well appreciated, it really highlights the complexity of trying to study depression in an animal model. Because you don't just have the range of symptoms, but you have different types of depression. But yet, we just talk about depression. And everyone argues about what is the best animal model for depression, when clearly, as you think about the different symptoms, there's a range of neural circuits that are going to be affected. There's a range of changes that are probably happening, varying from individual to individual. So it really is a difficult question to try to understand, especially with an animal model, the pathophysiology, really just because of the complexity and heterogeneity of the disorder. But it's important, as we all know, because it is a major cause of global burden in terms of disease. If you actually look at the leading disease categories, and you actually adjust by disability adjusted life year, you can actually see the mental, home, mental illness actually ranks at the top. And you could really argue that it is nearly a chronic disease of the young because of the actual age of onset and the fact that you could have this throughout <coughs> your lifespan. It's not, as you know, Alzheimer's, which is at, towards the end. And that's really missed, I think, often when people talk about mental illness, especially in the popular press. I look at it as just like a snapshot. If you actually break down mental illness on the right in terms of the leading individual disease, you can see depression actually ranks at the top. Thankfully, there are treatments, antidepressants being the most commonly applied. Um, but as we all know, they don't always work. Depending on the clinical study, between a half to perhaps uh, two-thirds of individuals may not respond. And those individuals are most at risk for suicide. In the US, the latest estimates from 2014 put at four, over 43,000 deaths uh, by suicide in the US. And just to sort of put this in some sort of 
comparison in that time range, there are a little over 16,000 homicides. So there's nearly a double amount of suicides per year than homicides, even though there's not much discussion on suicide. And to put this in a larger context, if you actually look 10 years before, the number of suicides were around 32,000. So they jumped dramatically in that 10-year period, where the number of homicides stayed constant at right around 16,000. If you look at this isn't even uh, this isn't a problem just in the U.S. If you look in the EU, for the same time frame, there were over 58,000 deaths by suicide. And in China, the estimates were over 200,000. So this is a huge worldwide problem. So as I mentioned, depression is the leading cause of disability. And I have over here to the right, this is an older figure, but I really like this figure because I think it really highlights an important point in that if you look at the 12-month prevalence of depression among US adults by gender, with females on the left and males at the right, you can see that it's quite stable among females and males. This isn't something that jumps around. This is something that's seen consistently pretty much year after year. And you can see that females have a two-fold increase in depression relative to males for reasons that are completely unclear. Some people have argued that estrogen may make you more susceptible to depression. Others have argued testosterone may make you more resilient to depression. And some have argued it has nothing to do with hormones, especially when you think about depression that occurs with comorbidity of certain types of diseases that affect older age. So it's really unclear. What is intriguing, though, is, again, there are treatments, primarily the primary treatment are antidepressants, which work equally well among males and females. So it really highlights there is a disconnect between depression and antidepressants in terms of disease pathology and treatment. And I'm going to come back to this point later, because there's a lot of literature about how an antidepressant is curing depression, or we're trying to highlight this idea of cure. Whatever depression does, an antidepressant must do the opposite. But as you all know, taking an antidepressant isn't fixing anything in terms of the pathophysiology of the disorder. When someone comes off the drug, they have depression. So we're not curing the disease, per se. And I think that's an important point as we walk through this talk. So our first foray, when I first started my lab, even though my work had all been in drug abuse, I decided to switch gears and to focus on depression. And there were a number of reasons why. I'd worked in a pharmaceutical for a number of years, and I was quite intrigued by the idea of what was an antidepressant response. And so what I did is I literally sat down for a week or two and went through every single paper look, looking at any sort of link between a potential gene that had been implicated and antidepressant responses. And the one that came out was BDNF. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, as you know, is quite a prevalent growth factor in the brain, plays important roles in development. And there were numerous papers out there that various antidepressants could increase BDNF expression. A lot of them had focused in the cortex and hippocampal region. And there was a lot of data, imaging data, really suggesting that the hippocampus may be involved in depression and potentially antidepressant responses. So what we did was, while there was all this data and a lot of reviews going on on BDNF, no one had actually tested the hypothesis. So what we did is we made a fancy mouse, which I'm not going to discuss. But what we did is we could delete BDNF selectively in the brain, in cortical hippocampal regions, in an inducible manner with a drug, tetracycline. So what we did is we made these animals such that we deleted BDNF in some animals at three months of age, some animals at two months of age, and some animals while they were actually within the mother. And we let all these animals get to six months of age. And we did that. We ran behavior on them and looked at a number of different aspects. And we could show we had deleted BDNF. And what we saw is that while the BDNF deletion was pretty comparable, regardless of the time of the deletion, we saw different behavioral phenotypes. The earlier we deleted BDNF, the more hyperactive the animals, and the more severe the learning and memory deficits. However, regardless of the time frame when we deleted BDNF, the animals didn't respond to antidepressants, per se. So all the data I'm going to show you has been done in multiple paradigms. I'm just going to show you the four swim test data as an example for the sake of time. So what we did, what you can see here, is in white were the littermate controls, and in black were the knockout animals. Oh, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Excuse me. On the left are the controls, which are littermate controls, and on, on the right are the knockouts. This is an, ex is an example with disipramine. Not only did we do all this in multiple behavioral paradigms, we also did this with multiple antidepressants. And what you can see is in the control animal, if you take the animal, you put it in a beaker of water with a certain amount of water, 
at a certain temperature for six minutes, you must measure the last four minutes of immobility. That an antidepressant causes a significant decrease in immobility suggestive of an antidepressant response. However, if we deleted BDNF, regardless of the time frame, what we saw was disipramine and a range of, with all the antidepressants that we tested, while the litter mate controls look similar, so the BDNF is not changing the baseline behavior, the animals did not show this change in immobility suggestive of an antidepressant response, suggesting that BDNF may be required for an antidepressant response. When we published this, it received a tremendous amount of attention because it was the first gene that someone came out and said may be required for an antidepressant effect. And right after this, um, the human BDNF polymorphism, the BDNF VAL66 met allele, was actually identified and it was examined and it appeared that there was an attenuated response in patients with this polymorphism. So we went ahead and continued to follow this up from a preclinical side where we actually ask what's important. We did a number of different knockouts, knocking out BDNF in various regions to try and hone in on a particular region. Because we really don't know the locus or the initiation site for where an antidepressant response is. So what we did is we took flocks to BDNF animals. So these are animals with wild type levels of BDNF. And in the experiments I'm going to show you, what we did is we did a viral mediated approach where we deleted with Cree recombinase tagged with GFP into subregions of the hippocampus, because all of our data with the various lines seem to be suggesting the hippocampus was important for this antidepressant effect. What we did is we injected bilaterally into different subregions. I know what's shown on the top is just a unilateral deletion in the CA1 region, but we did bilaterally into CA1, or in data I'm going to show you in the dentate gyrus. What's shown on the left side is the CA1. So if we took our flocks to BDNF animals and just injected them with GFP, the control, so they have wild type levels of BDNF, you can see the saline versus disipramine comparison. So you see that they did respond to disipramine, suggestive of an antidepressant response. And if we deleted BDNF, specifically in the CA1, these animals still responded to disipramine. And we looked at not only disipramine, we looked at other antidepressants, again, in other paradigms, and we saw the same thing. They all responded. However, what we noticed was something different with the dentate. And the dentate, again, the animals with GFP responded to disipramine, suggestive of an antidepressant-like response in the controls. However, they had an attenuated response when we deleted in the dentate gyrus. So it suggested that BDNF actually in the dentate may be mediating the effect. We went in and again, we saw this with numerous antidepressants. And through data, I'm not going to show you. This didn't appear to have anything to do with neurogenesis. So it's sort of like, what is BDNF doing? And that's something that we've continued to be interested in as there have been more and more clinical studies that have suggested, for the most part, that this polymorphism is actually required for an antidepressant response. However, there have been a few studies that haven't seen it. And the reason for this very likely may be because what are you comparing? You're comparing a BDNF polymorphism against everybody else. But we don't know how you trigger an antidepressant response. So if you have polymorphism and other genes are required for an antidepressant response, you probably are not going to have a typical antidepressant response. So it's really important to understand the mechanism so we can try to understand the pathway that's mediating the behavioral response. So as we've continued to try and understand this, and it's hard because BDNF can be activated in many different ways. You have a drug that's on board for several weeks. So how do you really activate it? As we've been trying to come through this, there were the clinical work that was published on ketamine. And as this audience knows, ketamine, which is a non-competitive NMDA receptor antagonist, very, very low dose, 0 0.5 mg per kilo infusion for 30 minutes in depressed and in treatment-resistant depressed patients actually triggered a rapid antidepressant effect. In some patients, it actually persisted for days to several weeks, which is remarkable for a drug that has a short half-life of a couple hours. So everyone's talking about ketamine. The reason why we got involved on this early on, though, were two reasons, and I think they're important. The first was ketamine actually showed for the first time that pharmacologically it is possible to generate a rapid antidepressant response. You don't need to have the hand waving of there's some type of plasticity. You can generate a rapid effect. And secondly, the fact that ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist allows you to think about how do you link the receptor to a signaling pathway and for the first time, hopefully, start to understand what mediates an antidepressant effect. And if you can understand that, then you might be able to go back to SSRIs and other drugs 
and see if there's a potential point of convergence. So our thought was, could we use ketamine and look at it as sort of a Rosetta Stone for antidepressant responses? So we did a lot of work with ketamine, which I'm not going to show you. We could show that ketamine at extremely, extremely low doses could trigger a rapid antidepressant effect without the confounds of hyperactivity or learning and memory deficits, what you see with NMDA receptor antagonists. However, when you start to go to increasing doses, even though they're still low doses, you pick up the hyperactivity, the learning and memory deficits that could confound the behavioral effects. And actually what we saw was that uh, one of our earlier papers was, was that as you kind of went up slightly in dose, you lose the antidepressant effect. So it was only in this low dose, which now seems to be suggestive of also what's being seen in the clinic in terms of the 0 0.5 mix per kilo. So we took animals, we put them in various behavioral paradigms to see does ketamine trigger a rapid antidepressant response? And it sounds like a silly question, but it's actually a really important question. Because these various paradigms that we use, that are used by drug companies to screen for rapid antidepressant responses, are based on that because FDA approved antidepressants causes particular change. But it's always been unclear that if you have a drug that works by a different mechanism of action other than potentially monoaminergic transmission, would it even work in these paradigms? What we found was that low-dose ketamine worked in the majority of these paradigms, not all. But things like the forced swim test, tail suspension test, sucrose, not social defeat. Interesting. Social defeat, you had to go higher in dose where you started to get confounds of learning and memory and locomotor activity effects. So we tried to concentrate on the paradigms that worked. If we stressed animals, ketamine also triggered a response in these paradigms. So the point was we needed an output. We have these behaviors, so what's our questions? So the first question we ask is, is the NMDA receptor important for the action of ketamine? And this was something that we thought was pretty straightforward and now, eight years later, uh, continues to be a point of discussion. So what we did is, in this experiment, we took C57 animals and we injected with them with either ketamine, CPP, which is competitive NMDA receptor antagonist, or MK01. And we were careful on the drugs we chose for reasons I'll get into later. We took NMDA receptor antagonists, we injected them to C57 animals and waited either 30 minutes or in a different cohort, three hours, a third cohort, 24 hours, or a fourth cohort, one week. So each time point is a different cohort of animals so that no animals were retested because of concerns of behavioral habituation. What we saw was that our low dose of ketamine, which doesn't trigger hyperactivity or learning and memory deficits, triggers a significant decrease in mobility suggestive of an antidepressant response within 30 minutes, which is this first onset that is seen in patients. And that that single dose persisted in terms of an antidepressant response out to a week, which is seen in some patients. CPP also triggered a significant decrease in immobility quickly, with effects gone after 24 hours. And MK-1 had very rapid effects, with effects gone before 24 hours. So collectively, this suggested to us that blockade of NMDA receptors is triggering the rapid antidepressant effect. Now, why ketamine is the only one that has a long-term effect is something we're investigating now. But we concentrated on really, if it is the NMDA receptor, does it signal in a particular way to trigger the antidepressant response. And one thing I should mention is, it is rather remarkable, again, a drug with such a short half-life ha at such a low dose is triggering prolonged effects. It's suggesting that even if it is blocking the NMDA receptor as we propose, it's not through a persistent blockade of the NMDA receptor. It's likely that some downstream effect may be happening to mediate this. So we said, okay, you block NMDA receptors, how can we possibly get a mechanism? Well, I had previously showed you that BDNF appeared to be required for an antidepressant effect in animal. There was clinical data suggesting the polymorphism uh, impaired antidepressant responses in humans. So we took our BDNF animals again. And this time what we did is we gave them the single low dose of ketamine. So what we could show was that in vehicle-treated animals or the knockout, just given saline, Again, baseline level is similar. You give ketamine, you can see the significant decrease suggestive of an antidepressant effect that's lost in the BDNF knockouts. Again, suggesting that BDNF is required. And we saw this at 30 minutes or in different cohorts at 24 hours. And this just shows we saw similar effects with MK01 with the antidepressant effect of MK01 gone by 24 hours in agreement with our previous data. So it appeared BDNF is required, but this is sort of important if we're going to study on signaling. 
So we went ahead and we made conditional truck v knockout animals. Truck v is the high affinity receptor for BDNF. We deleted truck v in broad forebrain regions in cortex and hippocampus. We characterized these animals in a range of behaviors. And what we could show relative to ketamine is that, again, deletion of truck v had no impact on this behavior or in any other paradigm that we looked at related to antidepressant responses, if you will. However, if you give ketamine in the littermate controls, you get this antidepressant effect that's attenuated in the track B knockout, suggesting again that BDNF and track B are required for this antidepressant response. Moreover, our data through typical antidepressants had really honed in on the hippocampus as an important site for the initiation of antidepressant responses. There were a lot of work I'm not going to show you here. So we just went in and we said, what happens if BDNF track B are required? What happens in terms of track B autophosphorylation, which is a sign of track B activation? So what we did is we took C57 animals, we gave them our low dose of ketamine, sacrificed the animals 30 minutes later, and we saw a significant increase in track B autophosphorylation in the hippocampus, suggesting that track B is activated. So what do we have? Well, what we have is the idea that we block NMDA receptors, and then you have this requirement for BDNF and track B. So how do you go from blocking NMDA receptors to requiring BDNF? And we did a lot of experiments on this. Our first thought was it's probably message. BDNF message goes up all the time. And surprisingly, ketamine didn't have any effect on BDNF mRNA expression. It did on protein expression. Protein expression went up within 30 minutes very, very rapidly and was back down within a couple hours. But we knew BDNF was required for this antidepressant effect. So it's not like BDNF has to be elevated but it's very rapid. And we went on to show that this was actually BDNF dendritic protein translation. And it wasn't just BDNF. Whenever we actually looked, there were a number of synaptic proteins that were rapidly upregulated by ketamine. If you wanted to mediate a rapid behavioral response, changing dendritic protein synthesis of proteins that impact synaptic transmission is one way you could mediate it. So that makes sense. But again, how do you go from blocking NMDA receptors to this rapid protein synthesis. And that became the quandary. Because if you think about it, there's numerous examples of how you could link it, it, NMDA receptors to rapid protein synthesis that could actually impact plasticity and long-term behavioral effects, even like LTP. You could link the NMDA receptor through activation of it, protein synthesis, long-term behavioral effects, and plasticity. The problem is, Ketamine is an NMDA receptor blocker. There is absolutely no precedent for how ketamine would actually upregulate protein synthesis in such a way and potentially trigger plasticity. And this became a question that we really struggled with. How could we possibly explain this? And what we came up with was the following model. And so this relies a lot on uh, a lot of work that's been done in terms of the synaptic transmission field. So this is a synapse. This is the presynaptic side, and this is the postsynaptic side. There's two types of neurotransmission in your brain. There's the evoked or activity-dependent transmission. So an action potential comes in. Vesicles release, vesicles containing glutamate in this example, fuse, releasing glutamate that binds to the NMDA receptor. Calcium flows in, and it activates downstream effects, such as CAM kinase 2, which we know is a rather promiscuous kinase that can trigger a number of downstream effects, including involvement and learning and memory and LTP. However, the other type of plasticity that's been well documented for the last couple of decades, but it's really been unclear if it has a role or what it could be, is this sort of background activity that's in your brain, this spontaneous transmission. So what's been shown through the work of Ege Kavalali and others is that these vesicles that release glutamate appear to be a different population than the vesicles that release glutamate in regards to action potentials or activity. And it's due to different proteins on these vesicles. So what happens is, it's just under baseline resting conditions, vesicles can actually fuse, release glutamate, that bind to the NMDA receptor, calcium comes in, but instead of activating CAM kinase 2, you activate CAM kinase 3, which is also called eukaryotic elongation factor 2 kinase. It's been shown that this is linked to NMDA receptors at rest. And what's intriguing about this kinase is it's been known for quite a while, like it was cloned in the early 90s. It hasn't received a lot of attention because it's rather unusual in that it only has one target. 
EEF2, eukaryotic elongation factor 2. So this kinase triggers phosphorylation of this protein, and it halts protein synthesis quickly, within 20 to 30 minutes. What's been shown is that if you block these spontaneous NMDA receptors, these NMDA receptors that are activated at rest, and I should point out that these receptors, there's no data to suggest that it's differences in NMDA receptor subunit composition. It appears through modeling where they actually occur in the synapse. So if you block these NMDA receptors at rest, then calcium does not flow in. This kinase becomes inhibited. What happens is, is you actually dephosphorylate with time, and you actually desuppress or get a rapid increase in protein synthesis within 30 minutes. So it makes sense. All this pathway, though, has been worked out in a number of cell science and nature papers, all in vitro. There's no real evidence that this actually works in vivo, let alone it has anything to do with potentially an antidepressant drug. What we did is we went in vitro, and we replicated a lot of these papers to actually show that ketamine does block spontaneous NMDA receptors and inhibits this kinase. It has functional effects on the receptors that we can record that trigger these downstream events. So we said, OK, let's find what happens in vivo. What we did is we took a low dose of ketamine in vivo, and what we found was that this kinase is, in fact, inhibited, and we get this rapid increase in BDNF protein translation in the hippocampus. So we said, OK, we have a start of a pathway. How do we test this? The whole point of having a hypothesis is to continue to test it. So what we did is pharmacologically, we obtained EEF2 kinase inhibitors. And I should mention that, like most kinase inhibitors, selectivity and specificity are two different things. But they were a starting point. What we did is we could show that these inhibitors, I'm just showing you one, Rodolin, but NH125 was the other we used. And they had similar effects. That if we gave these to animals, what we could see was that within 30 minutes, they triggered a decrease in phosphorylation of EEF2 in the hippocampus which is what you would expect to do if they were a kinase inhibitor. And they also rapidly upregulated PDNF protein in that time frame. And if we look behavioral at these inhibitors, these inhibitors actually could trigger a rapid antidepressant effect in the spore swim test, as well as in other behavioral paradigms. And if we went back to our BDNF knockouts, which we know is important, can we really link this in the pathway? What we could show is that, again, just deleting BDNF has no effect on our baseline behavior. But the EF2 kinase inhibitor triggers a rapid antidepressant effect that's blocked in the BDNF knockouts, showing that EEF2 is upstream and driving the downstream effect on BDNF in this requirement. And the fact that EF2 is linked to spontaneous NMDA receptors adds further credibility to the idea that this is an NMDA receptor-dependent cascade. So we went ahead and said, OK, this looks great. We have a hypothesis. It seems to make sense. But again, the kinase inhibitors could have other off-target effects. So to be more direct, we obtained the EEF2 kinase knockout animals. And these animals, we characterized in a range of behaviors. We could actually show that if we give the animals the, if we actually give the, sorry, if we actually give the litter mate controls ketamine, again, we see this rapid increase in BDNF protein. But we don't see this in the knockouts. And if we look in the EEF2 knockouts, what we see is, again, there's no change in baseline behavior. The litter mate controls respond to ketamine, but the knockouts don't, showing more directly that EEF2 is required for this effect. It appears, again, upstream of BDNF. So we have this sort of a model. You block NMDA receptors, these spontaneous NMDA receptors. And what we think is, is that the dose of ketamine is crucial for this. When you start at low, low dose, the spontaneous NMDA receptors can actually weigh in to have an impact on this cascade. When you get to higher doses of ketamine, you just block NMDA receptors that contribute to a lot of the adverse effects. So you block NMDA receptors. You have a rapid increase in protein synthesis that appears to be mediated through EEF2 that triggers this activation of TREC-V. So that's great, and that perhaps may explain, as we're hypothesizing, how you initiate the bat rapid antidepressant response. But what happens after that? And we did an experiment that was actually a replication of an experiment that Husseini Manji had done a few years earlier in 
didn't really explain it. It was just sort of an interesting piece of data, but we were quite intrigued by it. And the replication is here. If you take, again, your vehicle and inject it into C57 animals, you give ketamine, you get the significant decrease in immobility, suggestive of an antidepressant effect. And if you block AMPA receptors, there was no effect. However, if you give ketamine and block AMPA receptors, you block the behavioral effect of ketamine. So blocking AMPA receptors alone doesn't do it. They're not triggering the effect. It's downstream of NMDA receptors, but it's clearly required. And it suggests there's some type of plasticity. But again, you block NMDA receptors, you have this pathway effect, you increase protein synthesis. How do you get to plasticity? Because you're doing it through blockade of NMDA receptors. You know, activating NMDA receptors can trigger sort of an LTP-like effect. But blockade, people have shown for years, that if you take a hippocampal slice, which we think is important for the initiation of the antidepressant effect, you add an NMDA receptor antagonist like ketamine and record that there's absolutely nothing. It's flat. And in fact, we did those experiments, and that's exactly what we saw. However, we started thinking about it. How do you do the experiment? Well, you cut the hippocampal slice, you infuse the drug for about 10 minutes, wash out, and record. And again, ketamine doesn't have an effect. But ketamine doesn't trigger an antidepressant effect in 10 minutes either the initial early phase of the antidepressant effect is going to start around 30 minutes. So what we did is we infused ketamine for 30 minutes. And when we do that, we see this rather surprising potentiation. This potentiation is in the order of LTP type in terms of strength. It's quite stable, and it is not LTP. So what is this? I mean, we called it a novel form of homeostasis. We called it a novel form of plasticity. What we think it may be is a novel form of homeostatic plasticity. What happens is, is in terms of LTP, you activate glutamate receptors and you get this enhancement. Or with LTD, you have this block and you get a decrease. But there's been a lot of work, again, in uh, in vitro preparations, where what happens when you activate with a for a while? You don't just keep getting this increase. You have to sort of rebound in a sort of homeostatic plasticity. Or with decreases, you have to sort of rebound. But the question is, does homeostatic plasticity occur in the brain? And if so, how are you going to study it? If you suture an eye shut, you can see what appears to be sort of a form of homeostatic plasticity, sort of a rebound type effect, if you will. And I'm saying that very generously. If you lesion particular parts of the brain, you can see this rebound effect. But those aren't really endogenous type applications. And what we're suggesting here and what we're seeing is that ketamine, this low dose, is actually triggering this novel potentiation, which may be a form of homeostatic plasticity, which may account for the longer-term effect. This is dose-dependent, just like the antidepressant effect is. When we get to higher doses, we don't see this potentiation either. We've published data showing that Again, this isn't LTP, and we can still elicit LTP and LTD normally. It does not interfere. So again, what is this plasticity? We went on to really try to look at it and to try and get some understanding of what it's doing. We started from a molecular perspective. Again, if we just take our hippocampal slice and add ketamine, we see this potentiation. If we block the cut, if we use the EF2 knockout, which we think this kinase, again, which links to the NMDA receptor is required for the antidepressant effect, we can show it also is required for this potentiation. If we look at BDNF, we see the same thing in that we get this potentiation in littermate control slices, but not in the BDNF knockouts. So the signaling pathway that's required for the antidepressant effect seems to be required for this potentiation. But is it really plasticity? Again, we're kind of saying plasticity, potentially homeostatic plasticity, in particular because NBQX suggests the involvement of AMPA receptors. So we looked at this a little more closely. If we give ketamine to C57 animals and sacrifice them 30 minutes later, what we could see was an increase in surface expression by biotinylation of GLUA1 and GLUA2. We then took our EEF2 knockout animals or littermate controls and did the same experiment, again looking at surface expression of GLUA1 and GLUA2. And what we could see again is that in the littermate controls, you see this increase in GLUA1 and GLUA2, but not in the knockouts. 
suggesting that this was a pathway dependent effect. GLUA1 made sense in a lot of ways in terms of plasticity. GLUA2 was a little bit of a surprise to us because of the calcium requirement. But just because you have increases doesn't mean they're necessarily required. So we looked at this a little more closely. We looked at the potentiation. What we did is this time when we added ketamine to our slice, we added NASPAM, which blocks GLUA2 lacking AMPA receptors. And if you block GLUA2 lacking receptors, you still see this potentiation, suggesting GLUA2 is required for this potentiation. However, if we just added ketamine and this time added DNQX, which just blocks all AMPA receptors, we also block the potentiation, similar to how we could block the behavioral effect. And we obtain GLUA2 knockout animals. In the potentiation, we could actually show again that we see this potentiation in wild type animals, but not in GLUA2, showing that this potentiation required GLUA2. And behaviorally, ketamine does not work in the GLUA2 animals. So potentially we have this insertion of GLUA1 and GLUA2 that are involved in this potentiation that we're seeing. So we've been going on and trying to further understand this pathway. But the whole point of the hypothesis is to try and translate it so it has some utility. We can go on and talk about hypothesis and all of this, but what is the utility of talking about this to individuals that are putting ketamine in a clinic? Have we tested this? So the whole point, like I said, is to try and come up with working hypothesis. So when ketamine was first shown to have antidepressant effects, the first thought was, it's ketamine, what do we do? And then with some thought, the idea was, well, how does memantine do? Memantine is also an NMDA receptor antagonist. It's FDA approved for Alzheimer's. It's not great for the treatment, but you don't have the side effects. So there have been numerous clinical trials that have actually looked, does memantine trigger a rapid antidepressant effect because it would be safer, in theory. And so what's been showing Throughout the various paradigms, there's been no evidence of either rapid or long-term antidepressant effects with memantine. And some people have argued that because ketamine works and memantine doesn't work, that argues it has to be NMDA independent, which makes absolutely no sense. Because ketamine and memantine are not functionally the same compound. There could be differences. But if you ask a neurologist who's giving memantine to an Alzheimer's patient, would you infuse ketamine instead? Of course they wouldn't. Because they argue it's a different drug. They don't argue it's because it's not an NMDA receptor antagonist. So the idea in psychiatry of why this triggered this whole it's not NMDA dependent was a little perplexing. So we said we have a hypothesis. Can we test it? So I'm just going to show you one piece of data on this, um, testing the hypothesis because it becomes very biophysical. But the point was this. We did a lot of, we started off doing behavior with ketamine and memantine. And through dose response curves, we couldn't detect an antidepressant effect with memantine in rodents, which agrees with the clinical data. We dissected out the hippocampus. We didn't see the inhibition of the kinase, the increase in BDNF, and we also didn't see the potentiation. So memantine doesn't trigger an antidepressant effect. It also doesn't seem to have effects on this pathway, on NMD, or on the potentiation. What about the NMDA receptor itself and the function? So what we did is we did an experiment where we actually looked at memantine versus ketamine under depolarizing, or more evoked condition, if you will. And ketamine and memantine looked identical. But our hypothesis is that it's under this physiological magnesium at rest, sort of baseline transmission, where ketamine is having effects on spontaneous NMDA receptors. So what we did is we actually took, and these are just showing our recordings where we add ketamine or we add memantine. And what we could show is that ketamine has very specific effects on NMDA receptor function that aren't seen with memantine under physiological magnesium. So there are clear functional differences on how memantine and ketamine are interacting with the NMDA receptor that could explain the differences in signaling and the effect on the potentiation. So we went on to sort of try to further develop this model. But this is really our simple model. And um, it's become much more complicated in terms of where we've taken this. I was going to actually tell you a story of some recent data in the lab. And I'm just going to tell you it here in about 30 seconds and move to slightly different data based on questions that I received yesterday. Um, we've started focusing on this BDNF track B effect, hoping to start to 
focus in on where is BDNF made and where is it activated. Is the hippocampus important for this antidepressant effect? And we started off deleting BDNF and track B in the CA1, because this is where we see this potentiation. And what I can tell you is that if we delete BDNF and track B, either BDNF or track B in the CA1, we lose the antidepressant effect, and we completely lose this plasticity effect. And it's interesting, because if you do the same type of experiments where you're looking at LTP, BDNF and track B are modulatory. You see a slight decrease in terms of particular physiological measurements of, BD, of what you're looking at in terms of loss of BDNF or track B. It's not all or nothing. And we know BDNF is modulatory. But in terms of this potentiation, it really is an all or nothing type effect. And again, we lose the antidepressant effects. So it really suggests that BDNF and track B are acting in the CA1. Now, we don't know about CA3 and dentate and the potential impact of the pathway, so we're looking at that. But what I'm going to slightly shift gear on, based on comments from yesterday, is as we're continuing to do this, we have a study coming together on this kinase, understanding more of where it is and how it's triggering this antidepressant effect and potentiation, as well as everything of can we manipulate spontaneous transmission and what happens in terms of the behavioral impact. So as we're sort of pretending along these, um, two years and now, I guess two and a half years ago now, a paper came out, and I was asked quite a bit about this paper, so that's why I'm going to present uh, a little bit of work on this. And it came out that for all this, again, talk about ketamine being NMDA dependent for all the decades of work on its NMDA dependence in terms of blocking NMDA receptors, that ketamine doesn't work in that way. That it's actually a metabolite that's triggering the ketamine antidepressant effect. And it's actually a rare metabolite. It's not even in this... Um, met metabolism of ketamine early on. It's further downstream. And it was rather surprising, in particular this claim that it's NMDA inhibition independent. And what was particularly um, a little strange the day this article came out, I knew this article was coming out, I hadn't seen the data, and the day this came out, uh, my phone and email exploded. And there were two comments that came through. The first comment was, oh my god, your career is dead, it's NMDA independent, right? The second and equal comment was, congratulations on your recent Nature paper. Too bad you weren't an author. So it's like, OK, what, how do you resolve those comments? So I'm going to tell you how. So again, this is a pretty bold claim. Because as drug companies are focusing in on NMDA receptor antagonist, then if it's NMDA independent, how do you explain that? What is the mechanism? Well, how did they really come up with this being NMDA independent? And where does this start from? So it starts from the idea that if they took C57 animals, and this is their data, and they gave either MK to 1 or ketamine, and ketamine is a mixture of both R and S ketamine that's been given IV. You can actually show that within one hour, both MK to 1 and ketamine trigger a significant decrease in immobility in the four swim test suggestive of an antidepressant effect. However, if you look 24 hours later, ketamine has this long-term effect that MK to 1 doesn't. It's the exact same data that we previously published on. Our term was because of this, it really starts to argue for NMDA receptor dependence, and then we linked it to a signaling cascade. They had the same data, and they say, nope, it means it's NMDA independent. So it's OK. Same data, different interpretation. So what is the mechanism, and how did they get to this? What they did is they argued that it's clearly not NMDA independent. They went in, isolated from blood various metabolites, and they found one that when they added it back actually triggered an antidepressant effect. So how did they come with it NMDA independent? Well, most of that was all based on binding. And it wasn't even binding to the NMDA receptor. What it was is that the NMDA receptor is a channel. And MK to 1 is an open channel blocker. So it sits within the pore very tightly within the pore of the NMDA receptor. If you add ketamine, ketamine also has high affinity, it can displace MK to 1. When they added the metabolite, it could not displace MK to 1. So they argued that it was NMDA independent. However, a couple things to keep in account. If, even if you actually block at the same site of MK to 1, if you have lower affinity, you're not going to displace it. And if you block somewhere else other than that exact site, you're not going to displace it. There are many NMDA receptor antagonists that can't displace MK to 1. That doesn't mean they're not NMDA receptor antagonists. So the data was not completely clear that this was NMDA independent per se. But that was their claim. 
What was intriguing, though, what triggered a lot of the congratulations, you have another paper, but you don't, was that we recited in the intro we had gotten ketamine to work in animals with a whole group of people. But when we looked at the data, there was actually some interesting aspects that we noticed. In particular, if they actually took their metabolite compared to ketamine, what they could show is that this metabolite actually decreases phosphorylation of EEF2, suggesting that it's inhibited the kinase. And you get this rapid increase in BDNF protein within 30 minutes in the hippocampus, which is exactly what we had shown. So they've engaged the same pathway that we've linked to the NMDA receptor. But they didn't focus on this. This was data in the paper. They really focused on was this rather surprising finding that if they took their metabolite, what they could actually show is that by Western blot, they could see an increase in GLUA1 and very surprisingly GLUA2 in the hippocampus. Moreover, if they take the metabolite and gave it to C57 animals, and you gave MBQX to block AMPA receptors, it blocked, the AMP, it blocked the behavioral effects, suggesting a potential requirement for AMPA receptors and potentially plasticity. This whole paper focused pretty heavily on AMPA receptors because of this data, which was sort of exactly what we had shown. So it's like, OK. But the real kicker is this focus on AMPA receptors because they did this rather surprising experiment where they took a hippocampal slice and instead of just infusing the metabolite like you typically do, they did a long infusion. And they see this rare, rather surprising form of potentiation that if you give DNQX to block AMPA receptors, all AMPA receptors, you block it, which looks a heck of a lot like what we did. So while our pathway has gotten way more complicated, what I've shown you is our initial bearing through a number of papers suggesting that you link to the NMDA receptor this kinase which you inhibit, desuppressing protein translation, including BDNF, insertion of AMPA receptors, and this potentiation, which appears to be exactly what the metabolite is doing. So even though we weren't cited for this, it was like, really looks like our pathway. So what are we missing? It's like, I don't think we're missing anything. Let's go back, though, and do the experiment that should have been done. If you're going to claim NMDA independent, there's only one way to really do that. You have to measure NMDA receptor current. Displacing a binding is not unequivocal. And this just shows that this was their model, which has been really unclear of what is working here. And this was just sort of our straightforward model. So what we did is we did a technically challenging but straightforward experiment. We simply took the metabolite. And we simply asked, if you record NMDA receptor currents, is there any effect? That's it. And what we could show is that AP5, a known NMDA receptor antagonist, and ketamine both decrease charge blocking synaptic NMDA receptors. And H and K does as well. This is just a proof of principle where we're perfusing on quickly and recording. We could also show that under those same conditions, just a perfusing on quickly, whoops, that perfusing on quickly, we could also get this decrease in EEF2 phosphorylation, kind of reconciling their data that this could be through NMDA. And then, again, not to bore you, but just a couple pieces of data. If we actually looked at NMDA receptor function, we could show that the metabolite does, in fact, decrease NMDA mini amplitudes, as shown by the shift. I'm sorry, shift. And importantly, it causes a faster decay of NMDA minis, which this is just the actual trace. This is the overlay, and here's the data. So you see this decrease in decay time, no change in rise time. What does this mean? If you actually do the same experiment with ketamine, you get the exact same profile. It appears that H and K is taking on characteristics of the parent compound, ketamine, just with lower affinity to the NMDA receptor, which is something every drug company looks for when they make a drug. Does the metabolite in any way extend any sort of effect? So that appears to be exactly what's happening. I don't think it's that much of a surprise, per se. So we've published this. Um, and I think the one thing what this, we, we don't have data on this, but one interesting aspect of it is I don't think the punchline is that surprising, that we do think this is NMDA dependent, that this is working through the same thing. What may be happening, what is intriguing, is that the clinical data for the most part has really suggested that NMDA receptor block from the compounds that have exerted some sort of effect are mediating it. But regardless of which compounds, they just don't seem to look as good as ketamine, per se. 
that ketamine is the only one that has this longer term effect. And we don't know why. It's possible that ketamine, by blocking the NMDA receptor, triggers this pathway that we're suggesting, potentially this potentiation, which is involved in sort of longer term effects. And as ketamine is metabolized through weaker effects on the NMDA receptor, you could actually then potentiate ketamine's effect that you don't see with other NMDA receptor compounds. So that's one hypothesis to kind of put the data in perspective. Um, so just to sort of conclude and to keep us on time. So what we're proposing is a testable model of the molecular mechanism of ketamine action. And again, this is just sort of a starting point. It's become more of a cell with many other signaling cascades. And we're currently trying to actually, uh, in the early stages of uh, deal, talking with a number of clinicians, because based on where this pathway is extended, we think that there may be a particular gene with a known polymorphism that potentially could make patients not respond to ketamine. So we're actually having them look at blood right now to see in terms of the responders or non-responders, does this actually um, fit in? Um, why are we doing this? So we're doing this because we want to understand what an antidepressant effect is. Importantly, memantine doesn't trigger this change in NMDA receptor function, the effect on the pathway, or the potentiation. Why is that important? Because pick a ketamine paper out there. It does X, Y, and Z. Some of these are cell science and nature papers. You're changing firing. You're increasing this protein. You're doing X, Y, and Z. Well, you probably are. You're a psychotropic drug. But all those changes don't mean that that's how you trigger an antidepressant effect. Many of those things that are shown, especially in terms of some of the electrophysiology and firing, memantine is going to do the exact same thing, and yet it doesn't have antidepressant effects. So it's really important to use this sort of controls as we really try to at least put hypothesis forward of what ketamine is doing past just general, potentially NMDA receptor effects. Because as we know, not all NMDA receptors function the same way, and they not all trigger antidepressant effects. I showed you data on this metabolite that it blocks synaptic NMDA receptors, and it's similar to its parent compound. The concentrations that we use were just proof of principle. We're just perfusing on and looking. They should have no effect if it's NMDA independent. Clearly, there's an NMDA dependent. So the question is, well, is it relevant, though, because of the concentration? Of course it is, because we don't know the concentration that's at the synapse. There's been a lot of talk about what the concentration is at the synapse. Well, if you look at my microdialysis studies, which a lot of people have done in terms of glutamate, it's interesting. At, 20, at 10, 20 to 30, 50 mg per kg of ketamine, there's a lot of talk about this efflux of glutamate. Let's see. There's no dose dependence. The levels are all pretty constant, which is kind of interesting, sort of suggesting like you've sort of maxed out. But if you look at those concentrations of glutamate, there's two things that, that you notice. One is it's pretty much at an excitotoxic level of what we know about the levels of glutamate that actually occur within a neuron or at the synapse. And in fact, work by Craig Jar and Gary Westbrook have shown that there's very, very little glutamate that needs to occur at an NMDA receptor to trigger it. There's probably very little ketamine or a metabolite that has to be present to impact function. Moreover, the NMDA receptor is an open, ketamine like HNK is an open channel blocker. So the channel has to be open in some way. So how do we know and how do we study that? It's technically very challenging. But very small amounts can actually have physiological effects. The second thing, though, about this idea of this glutamate bursting is that, as I mentioned, if you go back to the papers, you'll see that 10, 20, 30, 50 have these high levels of glutamate. Well, here's the thing. Forget the preclinical data if you just look clinically. Higher doses of ketamine don't trigger antidepressant effects. So the fact that you have these range of doses, many that don't trigger antidepressant effects, either in rodents or in patients, just because, again, ketamine is producing something doesn't mean that's a mechanism of action. You have to take into account also the dose dependency would seen clinically. So, we're, so I think that's an important point, especially since there's a plethora of ketamine papers exploding that it's doing everything. It's like, what is the dose? What are the controls? How do we really think about this in a mechanistic way? This isn't just an SSRI where we're saying something happens. And the last and I think important point of this is, again, why are we doing this? It's not because I have some undying love of ketamine, per se. We're doing it because we're trying to use ketamine as a Rosetta Stone. What ultimately I'm concerned and interested in is what is an antidepressant effect? 
And I think one idea that I discussed yesterday with a couple of people when we were talking about this is that working closely with clinicians, having a lot of interactions. And some of the clinical data out there um, has shown that if you have an individual that's depressed and you give them an antidepressant, you know, about a half to two-thirds respond. But there's this group that clearly doesn't respond. And if you give those individuals ketamine, Carlos Zarate is claiming about 70%. Jerry Santacor is saying about 60% of them respond to ketamine. But there's still clearly at least a third that don't respond to ketamine. And those animals, those individuals don't respond to either drug. So what does that mean? Well, I think what it may mean is that if you give the antidepressant, it works however typical antidepressants work. If it doesn't work, it's because you probably have a polymorphism somewhere along that pathway. It could be in many different places. Therefore, if you give ketamine, ketamine is working via a different mechanism to come in to trigger the antidepressant effect. I'm not suggesting SSRIs work in this manner. It's a different way. And what it's suggesting is that there's a potential point of convergence such that individuals that have mutations downstream of that point of convergence then don't respond to either SSRIs or ketamine. So can we use ketamine as a roadmap and try to see if there is a point of convergence for SSRIs? And that could be either molecularly or perhaps in terms of plasticity. And if so, then could you start to identify other compounds that could trigger this plasticity or the particular molecular pathway to try and actually sort out individuals that may not respond to certain drugs but maybe other classes? So that's ultimately where we hope to go. So I just want to finish um, the acknowledgments. I was very fortunate. I moved about a year ago to uh, Vanderbilt to take over as the director of the Brain, and, uh, Brain Institute, and I was fortunate to have um, 11 of 12 people move with me. And the, that's a number of them right after we got to Vanderbilt. On the left are the individuals. Anita Autry uh, did the initial work with ketamine on the block of NMDA receptor in our initial hypothesis. Megumi Adachi did the localization of BDNF in the CA1 dente gyrate for typical antidepressants. Aaron Gideons did the memantine ketamine story, which I only showed you one slide. It was published in uh, PNAS. Conzo actually has continued on with pay, pay. Conzo did all of the metabolite, pay, the BDNF, truck B, and the CA1 dentate work, which is ongoing in terms of localizing ketamine's effect. And then Alina and Ege were involved with some of the initial electrophysiology as we looked at NMDA minis. So with that, I'm happy to stop and answer any questions. For that uh, outstanding presentation, um, behavioral data, electrophysiology, binding, pretty much the whole nine yards. <laughs> Very uh, uh, phenomenal data. Let me uh, open up the uh, discussion here. Well, very illuminating. Thank you very much. I'm particularly interested in this dose-dependent effect. I remember having a, a patient with a uh, recurrent premenstrual psychosis, mm -hmm. and lots of things didn't work. And a psychopharmacology colleague recommended we try bromocryptine in low dose. And I said, bromocryptine? It's a dopamine agonist. That'll make her psychosis worse. Um, but he said, no, it'll have a, you know, an inhibition on the presynaptic uh, terminal. And uh, so we tried it, and it worked. And rapidly mm -hmm. acting. And we only had to use it in the second half of the cycle, and she didn't get the GI side effects. And uh, I've also, you know, recently um, read that, you know, the cannabidiol's effects on sleep, it's the low dose that mm -hmm. enhances sleep quality, the higher dose, um, you know, disrupts sleep. And I'm wondering if this uh, effect on ketamine on the um, spontaneous neurotransmission that you identified mm -hmm. is specific to ketamine, or could that be potentially applied to other uh, cases of, you know, where there's this dose-dependent effect? So, and so ketamine is not the only drug that blocks spontaneous NMDA receptors. So there are other drugs now, you know, caveat is really it's an NMDA receptor antagonist. So how do you convince someone to sort of move forward? I think the approach may be more, at least what we're thinking of, is could you look downstream at potentially as EF2 kinase as a target or something else. But it's not at all just that ketamine is the only one that blocks 
others do. But they're also, what's interesting is we haven't done, we, we've looked at a couple of drugs that have moved forward in clinic, or at least attempted to move forward. And it is interesting in the fact that some of the drugs that have failed, well, all the drugs that we have tried that did not block spontaneous venom day receptors at rest have also failed. So that's about all I can say. We have to have other positive controls past ketamine, but if we haven't seen it, the, this potentiation correlates very nicely with the behavioral effect. So we're trying to understand it. But it is interesting. So there is clinical work going on at, right now looking at slightly increasing doses, and slightly more is not better. Slightly less isn't better. This seems like this sort of individual dose that was originally tried seems to be actually the dose that's working. But there's a lot of work clinically that's still to be done. Um, you know, what happens in terms of maintaining, what happens uh, in terms of this sort of effect on how you're going to maintain it from a molecular perspective or clinical. Hi, that was a really excellent talk and um, nice you. to follow the whole progression of your thinking through the, the process. Um, I'm curious about how ketamine might relate to sort of other neuroanatomical regions that might also be playing a role in depression. You know, we know there are effects of the dopamine system for reward and the hypothalamic systems for appetite mm -hmm. and sleep and frontal cortical regions for decisions mm -hmm. and all these. And um, do you really think it's something just glutamate in the dentate gyrus for the hippocampus or, or what would be the more global kind of implications of ketamine treatment there? So we think this is a synaptic effect. So we think there is synapse specificity. We don't think it's just all over things are happening. We focused on the hippocampus. A lot of this started off initially with a lot of human imaging data suggesting in terms of antidepressants. And I think this kind of comes back to an earlier point I said. Um, if you look at depression and the imaging data on depression, there's a number of different neural circuits and a number of different brain regions that have been implicated. And people, therefore, by default, have kind of said, well, then that's what you want to target for an antidepressant. Possibly. We don't know. But in terms of the imaging data, there's not a, as near as much data for many of these other brain regions that we've talked about in terms of stress and depression as it is for antidepressant responses. The hippocampus was the region we've seen, at least you know, from imaging and other, that has been probably the most consistent. I'm not suggesting it's by any means the only region. Our current thought, though, is, is that the dentate, we actually are doing a lot of work on the dentate. We actually are thinking that the hippocampus may be initiating the effect that then moves to the cortex and then from there out. That's our hypothesis. We'll see. It's a starting point. Some of these changes that we see, we have looked in other brain regions. You know, For example, like you said, the mesolimbic dopamine system. Um, if you look in, for example, the nucleus accumbens, there's pretty much virtually no feeding enough mRNA. You know, we obviously don't see the, the changes that we would see. So we've looked in other regions. Um, we've just focused on the hippocampus, again, as, also as a starting point. But we are starting to think about, you know, OK, if this is a starting point, what would you propose next? How would you sort of initiate it? And you know, we may have to refine our hypothesis as we move forward. We'll see. Also, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, oh, thank you. I'd like to extend on uh, Barb's question. And the, she was talking about the D2 dopamine receptors mm -hmm. and how uh, presynaptic D2 receptors have a higher affinity for dopamine than, than postsynaptic. Mm -hmm. And just sort of wondering your thinking on it, the dose dependence uh, of the ketamine effect. And is that saying something about the specific NMDA? Uh, receptor population. In, in your model, you showed mm -hmm. you you commented mm -hmm. that the spontaneous and and stimulated receptors have the same subunit composition. But isn't it saying something that the that that you see this effect at, at low concentrations, which suggests that the, it's a higher affinity population? Mm -hmm. And is there some way to get at that that that, that those uh, receptors are different? from the, all the other types of uh, glutamate receptors? So it's a good question. And there's been a lot of talk about subtype selectivity for uh, NMDA receptors. So when we first published our original paper, um, we spent a lot of time looking at this disinhibition idea. And we really could not find any evidence for it. So we proposed that it's NMDA receptors on excitatory neurons that are sort of mediating the effect. 
There was a paper then that was published shortly after that came from a Karolinska group. And they deleted NR1 subunits on inhibitory neurons, and primarily in the cortex. And to be honest, my general thought was, well, I think our hypothesis is right, but if you just delete NR1 subunit, that may be enough to you know, interfere with the ketamine response. They deleted NR1, the obligatory subunit of the NMDA receptor, on inhibitory neurons, and ketamine still produced an antidepressant response in all the paradigms, really suggesting that it wasn't on inhibitory neurons. A second group, Ben Hall's group, when he was at LSU, then deleted NR2B on excitatory neurons, which is where we thought it needed the effect, and ketamine didn't work. So to us, it's like, OK, it further suggests that this is through being on excitatory neurons. A number of pharmaceutical companies got very excited about this and have went through for the NR2B subtype selectivity approach. And, you know, I've been asked about this fairly often. My view is, you know, sort of okay. Um, an NR2B antagonist may very well work. I don't see how you get away from the side effects that you see with ketamine, per se. But I don't think that it means, the data means the way it's been interpreted to me. I think that the complexity of the problem really comes down to the fact that it is the NMDA receptor, and it's so important in so many functions, it's very tightly functionally regulated in many ways. Ketamine works as an open channel blocker, so the channel has to be open in order for ketamine to block. If you have an NR2B subunit present, then you have a longer open probability time than if you have NR2A. So it may be just biophysical that the reason why you delete NR2B is because you change how much open probability, therefore ketamine can't work. It may not be because of subtype selectivity in the way that we thought about it. It just may be the biophysical function of the channel. So that's clearly how we're thinking about it. We haven't done anything with like a fenpridol or drugs like that because they're not as selective. Um, you know, we'll see. But I think that a lot of the data that's been put out there that has these sort of certain views of what it a lot of it just comes back to the channel and just a lot of work that's been done over the last many years on the function of the channel and really thinking about it from that property. I'm going to ask a quick question here. Huh? So the focus is on non-responders, antidepressant non-responders and, and trying to turn them into responders through these novel approaches. And something you said early on about antidepressants is that they're, they're not a cure. That mm -hmm. when you come off antidepressants, you still have depression. And I think there's probably some clinicians in the room who might question that mm -hmm. assertion, that there are some people who come off antidepressants and don't have depression. There are some. Yeah, there are yeah. some. That's true. The idea, what I was arguing for, is more from the preclinical world, this argument that we have cured depression over and over and over because if you stress an animal, then you change this particular protein or whatever, and you fix it, right? We change whatever. And I think it's more complex. Sure. There are many subtypes of depression. There are some individuals, absolutely. You know better than I do, but absolutely. But this idea of a simple drug that's going to change whatever's in the brain magically, sure. that's a yeah, much no, no, more Yes, no, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a believer in magic. Um, so, so, uh, so you're magic. a psychiatrist, you're come magic. on. My wife's here, is the magic happens sometimes. But the, um, no, uh, uh, what I'm uh, getting at, though, is that uh, something must make those people different. Yes. And the people who, uh, who take an antidepressant and then don't have depression mm -hmm. are different in somehow from the exactly. people who take an antidepressant. Again, the heterogeneity. And, and, and so my question is, is there any thought about the convergence of these pathways uh, that might account for that uh, heterogeneity? Absolutely. The question, though, of treatment resistant, especially from a preclinical perspective, is so difficult. You know, people, I get asked, I can't even tell you how many times, like, can you make an animal that's treatment resistant? And it's like, are you kidding me? Of course I can. Any of us can. I mean, just go downstairs, take any of your animal lines, give answer. There's probably something that's not going to respond. Why? We have no idea. I think the view is that, um, you know, can you make an animal treatment resistant as if that's going to be a homogeneous population? The individuals that you see that are treatment resistant are probably treatment resistant for so many different reasons, so many different changes. So we can't just model this as one animal, and I don't know really how to get at this question right now. So we're trying to focus it more on the response and hopefully with time start to get into the questions you're asking. But at least from a mechanistic standpoint, I don't quite know how to get there yet or even how to approach that problem, even though it's a very important question without doubt.
since we're talking about rapid antidepressant response, uh, the most rapid response that I've learned about is deep brain stimulation, mm -hmm. where the response is within seconds. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could help me integrate uh, those findings. And I'm not sure whether there's any uh, pharmacological studies that have uh, that have been done related to deep brain stimulation. Mm -hmm. But can you help me integrate those? So deep stimulation, where? Where in particular are you talking? Uh, Subcolosal anterior cingulate, uh, Helen Mayberg's work. So Helen Mayberg's work, um, you know, and I'll let the clinicians address this more closely. I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. Um, but deep brain stimulation works and has only been shown to work in a very, very small number of patients. Um, how that could pinch digitally overlap to here, I don't know. We haven't looked at it. I mean, there's been a lot of interest over the years in deep brain stimulation. There's probably a subpopulation of patients that respond. That's why she's focused on that particular subgroup that she's very good at identifying. But how this would overlap here, we don't know. Could you change activity and reset the system? I don't know. I mean, it's something we're interested in, but it's not something right now that's driving what we're doing. In fact, one of the things we've actually done, um, you know, which is an old trim, and is ECT. How does ECT work? Does it have any sort of effect? And it's funny, if you go into the preclinical literature, there's a lot of claims made. Um, and the work, which I didn't appreciate closely until I was looking at it, is pretty much all done in rat. Because with mice, which would be important if we wanted to do, you know, look at particular molecules or pathways, um, mice often jerk and they break their neck. So most of the work has been done in rat and there hasn't been much in terms of genetics. So we're trying to actually go in, work through ECT in animals, show behavioral effects, and then start to see if there's any sort of way of potential overlap and looking if there's a pathway involved. Christy. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I'm really curious about the role of estradiol in this, in this picture, since we know that it can uh, modulate BDNF expression and also has a, um, interactions with BDNF in the hippocampus and cognition. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. And if you've studied this in like males versus female mice, and mm -hmm. whether estradiol could augment ketamine's effect. So when we first saw this BDNF requirement in terms of typical antidepressants, we kind of went down this path and um, talked to a number of clinicians because the question really was, okay, this is interesting. What happens in terms of responders? if in terms of just typical antidepressants adult population. Males and females, is there bias in terms of responses? And the answer seemed to be no. There are clearly differences depending on certain types of depression, like what fiber works on. So we haven't went down that path. I can say in terms of our preclinical work, both with um, typical antidepressants as well as ketamine, we've used both males and females. They both respond similarly to ketamine. They both have this potentiation in the same molecular cascade aspect. Um, there has been some data in the literature suggesting that there may be a difference between females and males in terms of preclinical rodent responses. I mean, we slightly see it, but I, I honestly don't know what it means. I mean, if you see a difference in 10 seconds in a forced swim test on males versus females, I'm not sure that really has any translatable meaning, per se. So we see pretty much the same in terms of the responses to ketamine. Again, certain types of um, depression, it's probably more important maybe than in others. But right now, we've just sort of taken it from a more high-level approach because we haven't seen effects in adult animals. Mm -hmm. Run across the divide oh. here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of your specific question, no. Because it's an acute blockade. Ketamine is not just blocking spontaneous transmission for long periods of time. We think what it's doing is it's just blocking the receptor, initiating the pathway, the rapid protein synthesis, 
and it's gone. You may prolong it perhaps through the metabolite, but you're not having this persistent blockade as if we just blocked all spontaneous transmission in the brain. So I think there's something to be said between sort of acute versus just chronic. I mean, a lot of times when we do things with knockouts, you know, it's just completely not present. And you may get a very clear effect, but pharmacologically often you don't see that because the complexes or whatever are there and you're just suppressing in a different way. Um, so I don't think it's just this global suppression aspect. Um, we have started to look at the long-term effects of ketamine because repeated ketamine dosing is something people are looking at clinically. There's been some discussion that um, with repeated treatment, they actually may have sort of a stronger type response, not in a bad way, but it may be sustained longer. It's a lot of anecdotal evidence. So we'll see with more papers published on the clinical side really what it means. I can say that this potentiation that we see is stable for several days. We lose it. When we give ketamine again a week later, this potentiation comes back and is even slightly enhanced for a few days before it goes away. So we don't quite know what that means. It is interesting, though, that you, again, can, trig can trigger it in a slightly, again, enhanced manner through acute blockade. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I really appreciate it. My name is um, Drew Belknap, and I've run a ketamine clinic in North County for approximately three years now. Mm -hmm. And I've treated nearly 200 patients. Um, and I, I had a question for you on the dose response, because when I initially started, I stuck closely to the 0.5 milligrams per kilogram route. And... Um, I was not seeing, you know, I was seeing lower success rates. And so I started to notice some things in the literature coming out talking about patients, if they experience more dissociation, mm -hmm. they tended to have a more robust antidepressant response. So I started pushing up the dose per the patient based on their level of dissociation. And I started to have more success, um, more significant results uh, from the ketamine. And what I've learned really in the last year and a half is that every patient has a dose that works best for them. And for some reason, you know, um, sometimes they, you know, they get this marginal response until you, you hit this one dose and it's like a light switch goes off mm -hmm. and they're just like, oh my gosh, this is what people were talking about. And, and I don't know if that's just also because it's slowly building or if it's you hit that dose mm -hmm. that works best for them. Um, but regardless, I've had some of my earlier patients, my, my very first patient was one who um, didn't respond, mm -hmm. um, which was a little frustrating with your first patient, but he had tried everything, every drug in the book, he tried ECT, nothing had really helped him, and I didn't help him with ketamine either, and about, he came back to me a year and a half later, he's like, man, I'm still reading all this great stuff about ketamine. So I said, well, I've been going up on the mm -hmm. dose, you know, for patients who need it, I went up on the dose with him and I treated him at about 1.4 milligrams per kilogram, but I, I didn't just start there. I, I worked up slowly and when I got there, he actually responded, mm -hmm. which was remarkable. Mm -hmm. And so I found that with more patients, I've had some patients, they had zero response. I, mo the majority of my patients fall somewhere between 0.5 and 1. I have outliers on both ends, mm -hmm. some less than 0.5, some more than one, um, but these patients that are above one, um, it's, it's remarkable. Some of them, they're just like losing faith, but they have nothing else. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it's like poof, this light switch goes off. And I've done that at like one, I, cause they were so desperate cause nothing was working. Mm -hmm. I had responses at 1.6 mm -hmm. and 1.7. There's some ketamine clinics that I'm aware of. They just go high period. And in my, in my estimation, I don't believe in that because I mm -hmm. think you really should use the lowest effective dose possible for safety reasons mm -hmm. with each patient. But I, I've seen, so, so that thing doesn't really, it doesn't really click other than to say that some of these patients I've noticed tend to, they, they say they tend to need higher doses of most medications. And some, sometimes you take that with a grain of salt, other times it's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. And this one patient who I treated, um, she, uh, it took, nearly two milligrams per kilogram to get her to respond. Wow. And um, before that, she was suicidal. She was really struggling. And, and, uh, but I noticed she would leave, and I would ask her, how, how long did the 
effects last, and she'd be like 30 minutes, an hour, mm -hmm. after receiving like 1.7 milligrams per kilogram. And that's what tipped me off, like this is not hanging out. And so when I went up, boom. And she's been stable now for eight months mm -hmm. on, on that dose. And so again, I feel like there's this dose response relationship. Right. And since then, I've had, out of the nearly 200 patients that I've treated, I would say, honestly, maybe about 10 or 11 who said they got zero response. And the others have seen response, but they didn't quite hit that 50% mark, where I, which I consider success. And so I tell my patients our success rate is around 86% as far as getting at least 50% response. But that's because I, I personally am with the patient the whole time. And what I find is that the limiting factor is the dissociative response. Some people are not as comfortable with that, so you have to make them comfortable in order to be able to get them to that dose that's going to work best with them. And I talked to the lead researcher at the Mayo Clinic because they stay more closely around the 0.5 dose. And I asked her, I was like, are you telling these patients if they don't have success that maybe they should go to a place that's willing to go up on the dose? And I got, you know, a, no, a non-answer, essentially. And, and so it's just interesting to me. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that So, So preclinically, when we're talking about different doses, we're talking at much higher doses. So we're sort of comparing like the low dose to more the psychotic dose of like 20 to 30 mg per kick of an animal versus like the anesthetic dose of 50 to 60. The dose response clinically, I think probably the most intense study that's being done is by Mauricio Favio right now looking. And sort of anecdotally, 0 0.5, they're claiming seems to be perhaps the best dose. They're not up above like 1.0. Those are still, you know, relative to ketamine and what you could use, still considered low. So we'll see. I think there's a lot of work going on on the clinical side in terms of what is the right dose, dosing regimen. For our purposes in terms of low dose, like I said, we've sort of sampled it because a lot of work that's been done on ketamine in terms of the antidepressants are being based on literature when people were using NMDA receptor antagonists to model psychosis in animals, if you will, or schizophrenia-like behaviors. So again, 20 to 30 mg per kg we're down around like three to five mix per king in an animal. So they're very different effects, which is different than sort of the dose dependence that you're seeing. Um, those are like the highest numbers. I'm not a clinician. The highest numbers I've heard, like 1.7. Most people have really stuck to around 0 0.5. I know at UT Southwestern, we stuck pretty much to that dose with concerns of going higher until clinical studies came up to see if you could even go higher without potential side effects. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. So I'm really intrigued by this this comment about dissociation, and then you're about three or four questions back. You touched on the idea of circuitry in the context mm -hmm. of ECT. Um, so I don't know what happened with scopolamine, but at one point in time, there was a couple of pilot studies or something suggesting that scopolamine also had this rapid uh, antidepressant mm -hmm. effect. And so if I put together those three those three items, ketamine, scopolamine, and ECT, what that says to me is an anti-amnestic effect, right? And so what, I'm sorry? An anti it's an am amnestic effect, anti-memory effect, right? I mean, this is what these these things do, among other properties. If you if you ask what they all do together behaviorally, mm -hmm. they make people forget things. So I was wondering if if again, getting back to what you said about circuitry, if if possibly one of the avenues that needs to be pursued is the degree to which this breaks basically associations, right? So one way potentially of looking at depression is that you have an inappropriate strengthening of association between every stimuli, you know, every stimulus mm -hmm. out there, and this negative affective response. It's a really good question. It's something we've thought about a lot, and it's something that you know it hasn't went, it it hasn't went unnoticed by us that it is the hippocampus we're saying. So what does that mean? You know, again, it's been very low doses in terms of ketamine, very low doses in terms of scopolamine. But these are questions we're trying to think about. And what does that mean? Why would the hippocampus be involved? So I don't have any data on this, but it is something we've been going back and forth on. Because I think it's an interesting idea. I mean, um, we thought about this years ago, actually, with ECT. Because we did some work with ECT in rats. And we're like, oh, hippocampus, and learning, and learning and memory deficits. And the problem was the literature was such a mess that it was like, maybe we're just going off on a tangent. But then now, for the exact reasons that you mentioned, we're sort of back now. Well, maybe there's something more there than just a lot of early work that was, you know, suggesting 
and we weren't really clear. There was like some states suggesting yes, some suggesting no. Is this really a rabbit hole that we could potentially be going down? Now I feel like there might be more basis to actually look at it. Well, uh, thank you all for the great questions. Thanks for the fantastic grand rounds. As part of our tradition here at UCSD, we'd like to leave our grand round speaker with oh, awesome. our UC San Diego School of Medicine and in the Department of Psychiatry oh, awesome. chats. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can uh, order some online and have all of your trainees wear them. as, they're, as My trainees are going to be like, we want to come to San Diego. Thank you so much for this excellent <laughs> Thank conference. you.